What is going on, everybody? Jamie Shaw here, Absolute Basketball. Super excited for today's, uh, today's guest, the head coach um, of UC Riverside, Mike Magpio. How does that sound, first of all, to say head coach? Oh, it's awesome, man. I mean, it's, it's you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll sit back and think about it, and, and, and it's definitely a dream. Um, and, uh, but for the most part, in these first, like, 50 days that I've been head coach, it's been just been going, you know, morning to night nonstop. But now I've kind of gotten a little chance the last few days to sit back and think and just, you know, kind of smell the roses a little bit, and, and it's, it's a great feeling. We watch Absolute Basketball you know, kind of smell the roses a little bit, and, and it's, it's a great feeling. That's good. And as you said, you know, you've been for 50 days now. You've had a little bit of chance, as you said, recently to kind of smell the roses and stuff. How are you doing with it? I mean, are, are you able to kind of to slow down for a second, actually, you know, live a little bit of life as well as run a program? Yeah, actually, funny. My wife, who's uh, 20 weeks pregnant now, uh, we just took a little two-day trip down to the um, – down to the water and uh, La Jolla and just drove down there and just kind of took two days to just, just relax and just sit on the beach a little bit, but it's been great. You know, our staff and myself, I'm real proud of us. Like we've, we got a hundred percent retention in a coaching transition, which is really hard to do. So we have the full team coming back. We have the whole coaching staff completely committed and, and in on what we're trying to do. And so, you know, we've had just finished our summer six week summer program virtually with our team and, and, all the guys are in and now they're starting to trickle back. We have a couple of guys back from um, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, they're all just starting to trickle in over the next two to three weeks. We're in a quarter system, so we don't start school till October 1st. I got you. Um, so, you know, you've had quite the, the story, you know, getting into where you're at right now. Um, but growing up in Hacienda Heights, California, how did you fall in love with the game of basketball? I'm Filipino, so that's that's been <laughs> that story's been told. And so, if you are a Filipino, it is our national sport. So you grow up with a basketball in your hands as a baby. My my mm-hmm. parents, my dad coached me growing up. Um, Hacienda Heights is in Los Angeles, so we're huge, huge Laker fans, and um, it's it's just part of part of me, you know. And uh, I was always I was a pretty good player growing up. wasn't good enough to play in college, and, and that's kind of why I started coaching. Mm-hmm. Um, I started coaching junior high when I was in, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and then from there on, just kept coaching high school and somehow got to this level. <laughs> so, uh, you know, who were some of your early coaching influences that you had? Well, it's funny, like, so I was 15 and my dad's like, why don't you help me out coaching your little brother and your little sister's teens? And I kind of was just his assistant and, and just started coaching at a young age. And so I guess my dad would be number one. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, it, I think it really matters. When I was young, I had really good baseball coaches and I had really good basketball coaches. And that it's crazy when you're that, that age from eight years old to like 15, 16, having really good coaches really matters. And I kind of looked up to those guys. And um, But, you know, as I kind of got older, growing up in L.A., you got Pat Riley, Phil Jackson, two of the mm-hmm. best ever. And then of course, Eric Spolstra, another, you know, the, the one Filipino in the NBA that we have, he's half Filipino. And Brad Stevens kind of got me thinking, that, okay, I, I could do it at the college level. Brad Stevens was in the business world, was at an insurance company at one point. And we, you know, he was, he was a guy that I was like, oh, you know what, I think I can do it. And that's how I started writing letters to colleges and somehow got in with Kyle Smith at Columbia in 2010. And, and you mentioned Brad, uh, Brad Stevens being in insurance and stuff, because that's kind of where you went after graduating from UC Santa Barbara uh, with a business economics degree. You jumped right into the business world, and you were the CEO of a multi-million dollar uh, real estate firm. You know, for those seven years that you did that, like, how did you, uh, did, did you feel like, did you do that because that's like the path you felt you were supposed to take? Or, no. or, or what, what was that whole seven years like? You know, when I was younger, I used to write like whatever my three, the three professions I wanted to be. And I was like really ambitious. I didn't want to be like president of the United States, CEO <laughs> of Microsoft or CEO of Disney. Those are the three things I'd always tell my mom. And uh, but so when I graduated, I was actually in a real big corporate job at Comerica Bank in middle market commercial lending. And I did that for a couple of years. And funny thing, I was playing pickup basketball on Hermosa Beach and some guy we won a bunch of games with. And I was walking out to his car and he was driving this really ridiculous BMW and I was like what do you do and he's like oh, I run a real estate company down the street in Redondo Beach and I went to go see him that week I put in my two weeks with my old company and started working for him 
And I started working for him for a year, realized, started to learn it. It was during the boom. So everybody was doing well, to be fair. You know, like a lot of people, you could have been running a real estate company. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up starting a real estate company after a year, learning it from this, this guy. And I started it with my best friend and business partner, um, my best friend from college. And we started a company and it just happened to grow. It was during the right time. And so we kind of went through the boom and then we went through the bust in, in 07, 08. And, but I was always coaching at the same time. I always coached a high school team, a local high school team, Redondo Union High School, Newport Harbor and Newport Beach and Elisa and Miguel in Orange County. And so that was always my hobby during like November to February. And the joke with my, my business partner was that's when our company suffered. I was like <laughs> so into the basketball season. I, we, we have a loss and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be locked in at work the next morning, but you know, the it, very sim parallel, parallel lives. Like you, you, you're coaching your company just the way you would coach your team. You know, we had a, a 40 employees at the time. That was as big as our company got. And uh, very similar, very similar. I, I mean, I learned just as much coaching that company as I, as I did coaching a basketball team. And then you, you know, so you're coaching the high school teams and all that stuff during the thing, I guess, to, to kind of keep the itch, cure the itch, I guess, that you have for it. But then all of a sudden you start writing letters to these coaches and stuff. As you said, you got on with Cal Smith at Columbia. Um, you know, what was making the transition of giving up a multi million dollar business and jumping into kind of the bottom rung of coaching? Not bottom rung, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, was, starting yeah. a career all over. Was that a tough decision? And kind of what all went into that for you? Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I told you this story. I think I interviewed with you when I was coaching at Campbell. Yes. And uh, I told the story before, but it was a, yeah, it was a hard decision. You know, I, I wrote a letter. I was actually going to get my master's in real estate at NYU because we had survived the real estate crash of 07, 08. And we had our company. Now we, we, were not, we weren't at 40 employees anymore. We were at like 15. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yeah, I got to learn. Like, if we can't let this happen to us again, I got to expand our business, blah, blah, blah. So I wrote letters to colleges all up in New York City, every single one, NYU, any, any, any D2, D1, D3. And, and Kyle Smith responded and he had me meet him at a coffee shop. And actually what he told me was like, don't do it. I'm like, well, then this is what I tell all the young coaches. Don't do it. You're going to start at the bottom. You're not gonna, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 I think I can do it. And he's like, yeah, 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 I know you're a sponge, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know, why don't you come volunteer for us at, at our camp next, next month? It was June. So I did. I came back. I wasn't starting school yet. I flew back from L.A., started volunteering. And, like, the coaching staff really took to me. Carlin Hartman was associate head coach. And they just took over the job. Carlin Hartman's now at Oklahoma. And uh, Kobe Altman was on staff. And he's now the general manager of the Cavs. So, you know, I didn't, it was a star-studded staff at the time. I didn't even realize. And I was just coming in. And, they, you know, I just hustled my butt off. And Kyle said, okay, if you really, really want to do this, here's the offer. It's director of operations. You're starting at the very, very bottom. I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't, I didn't play college, so I didn't know what director of operations is. They said, like you said, the bottom rung. Mm -hmm. And um, you're really not allowed to coach, really. It's, yeah. it's a coaching staff, but you're not allowed to be on the floor yet. But I didn't know. I just was like, oh, my God, here's a chance. And he said, if you want it, you got to be here in two weeks. And I, and I took it, you know, and, and it was crazy, basically. He's like, you can't go to NYU. And I don't know what you're going to do about your company. I ended up selling my, my half of the company to my business partner uh, a year later. So, yeah, it was a tough decision, uh, but it was my chance. You know, if I really wanted to do this, I had to jump in now at that point, and I did. And then going from, uh, you know, 2010 to 2017, uh, you, you go up from uh, director of basketball operations to being a full-blown assistant. You're on the road for both uh, Columbia and then Campbell. What all did you learn, or how did those two steps, Columbia and Campbell, how did they differ? And then what all did you take away, I guess, from both stops? Oh, Campbell, my three years at Campbell under Coach McGeehan were uh, tremendous for me as far as my growth. You know, I, I was at Columbia and that was my only coaching tree. You know, I didn't have a coaching tree. My coaching tree was Kyle Smith. Mm -hmm. And so we had success there. It took us like three, four years to build it at Columbia. And during that time, like Kyle Smith and Chris Mooney at University of Richmond were very, very close. They coached together at Air Force. So, and Carlin Hartman had worked at Richmond. And then we took over, mm -hmm. we hired Kevin Hubdy, who was a player at Richmond, as our grad assistant, who became an assistant, who's now associate head coach at San Francisco, one of my best friends. So there was a very, we were married to each other in a, in a weird way. And uh, Kevin McGeehan had the job at Campbell and he lost a guy and he, he actually, offered me a position and Kevin McGeehan is a great recruiter and he recruited me down there, picked me up at the airport, did the whole deal. And, you know, I kind of, I fell in love with Campbell because number one, it was completely different. It was just opposite. Columbia it was academic, no scholarships, really challenging Ivy league, beautiful, great place, New York city, obviously. And then I go to Campbell, which they beautiful arena, 
you know, the South, completely different. New York City, people are mean. The South, everybody says hi to you. And, uh, you know, I, and, I, and I just, just and scholarships. And I wanted to prove that I could coach at a different, you know, I wanted to expand my tree. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to prove that I could coach at a different, <clears throat> it's not a different level, it's just a different world, you know, completely yeah. different recruiting world. And co- coaching completely different guys. And uh, went to Campbell for three years, and it was, it was awesome, man. Like, Coach McGeehan really allowed me to grow and allowed me to coach there. And uh, I'll always be grateful to him for it. And then speaking of kind of a different world, so your first job is at Columbia, you know, in New York City or New York. The second job is down in the south in, in, in North Carolina. And your third job in San Francisco on the other side of the, of the complete country. Kind of what all went – obviously Kyle Smith and, and everything, that, that tree, but going from on the road – to an ops position, what all went into that decision? And then, you know, how did the, the move go from coast to coast? Yeah, that was, well, I'm from Southern California. So yeah. that was a, a pool. So we had, so Kyle Smith called me and he said, and he, he had been there for a year and he asked me if I'd want to come back to start operations. And at first I was like, no, like, I, <laughs> I love it here. I'm coaching, you know, I'm, um, you know, on the floor coaching. I love coaching. It's, it's, it's what I love to do. That's my passion in between those four lines in a practice. That's my favorite thing in life. And he's like, well, if you want to get back to California and, and, and this, this would be your chance. Like you will, will you'll hope that one of our people in our coaching tree get a head coach job and they'll end up hiring you or you'll be next assistant here, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I thought about it really long and hard. It was tough, man. Coach McGinn and coach Thomas and those guys, I was really close to those guys. And I just, but I, I thought, you know what, building my career close to my family would be really cool. And my wife, who I met in New York City, actually is from Southern California. And, and funny enough, she graduated from UC Riverside. Mm-hmm. And um, I just thought it was a good opportunity to be close to family. If you can cut, co- like right now, I'm living the dream. If you can coach where you're from, that's the dream right there. Yeah. Like and right now, currently, I am living the dream because you never know. You have to be geographically flexible. That's what Kobe Allman used to say <laughs> in this industry. And so I jumped and I went, and those were like, my closest friends, Todd Golden, who's now the head coach, he's, he was in my wedding and Kyle was in my wedding. And so it was a really cool opportunity to go work back with my Columbia guys at a, high, a little higher level in the WCC and challenge ourselves against the Gonzagas and St. Mary's and BYU's and get back to the West Coast. So you're very active in the Asian, co- Asian uh, coaching community. Uh, you started the Asian Coaches Association and even became the first Division I head basketball coach uh, of Asians and Synth. Uh, whenever you became the head coach of UC Riverside. How important is it to you to trailblaze within the Asian coaching community? Okay, I got to give credit now. So I've done my research. Rex Walters was head coach, and he's half, he's half Asian, so he's Asian descent. And then in 1940s, there was a Japanese head football and head basketball coach at Arizona State. But we'll say in the modern, <laughs> in the modern uh, this generation, yeah, I am the first, definitely the first Filipino and first full Asian in this, this generation. But, yeah, it's uh, – it's funny, in 2012, it was Kyle Smiths and Kobe Altman's who were sitting in the office there. It was their idea. They were part of the Jewish Coaches Association. They're like, why don't you start the Filipino Coaches Association? I'm like, That'd be, there'd be two of us. It'd be me and Spolcher. <laughs> and so they're like, ah, ha, ha, so let's do the Asian Coaches Association. And, you know, the first one we had, I just threw a little event at the Final Four in, in Houston in 2012. And we had like six Asian coaches show up, 13 total guys show up. And but you know what? I stuck with it, and the next year grew a little more. And now we get like we had Spolstra come by two years ago, and he was playing the Timberwolves, and we've grown to 150 to 200 people come to every single one. And so it's something that I'm proud of. And like now, what's crazy about this coronavirus uh, time is that we kind of gotten the Zoom going, and now we've seen like the women's Asian coaches and the men's Asian coaches, and it's just it's grown where our, our weekly Zooms turn into, we get anywhere from like 60 to 100 plus Asian coaches every single week. And so they're out there. And then I, and I tell them the same thing that Kyle told me, don't do it, don't do it, you want to, don't do it, don't coach. It's not as great as you think it is. You're not making any money, you're working for free. But you know, we got a lot of hungry young Asian coaches out there. So really proud to lead it. Uh, but you know, it's, 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 it's just part of, part of, part of the, who I am. Mm-hmm. And then uh, kind of – so I got firsthand to see the Kai Soto thing this past year and how just unbelievably beloved he is in, in the Philippines and all that type of stuff. I mean, everything that we ever did of him just, you know, it, 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 was, it was awesome. Right. Are you, do you, do you kind of carry that same type of thing with the Philippine, the, the Philippine nation as well? 
Yeah, you know, I've done so many interviews. When, when this went down, I did some local Riverside interviews, Southern California interviews. But when I got the head coach job, I've done probably 15 interviews in Philippines ESPN, Manila Times. I mean, that, that's where it really caught, caught fire just because I'm the first Filipino college coach, Division One college coach. So, yeah, I mean, and you, you'll, you'll see with guys like Kai Soto. And then there was a guy named Kobe Paras who came mm-hmm. here and he, was, he went to play to Creighton, UCLA Creighton, and, and didn't quite, quite make it to where he wanted to go to. But these guys have, like, so many Instagram, Twitter followers. You'd be shocked. Like, Kai Soto is – he's already a su- superstar over there. Yeah. Like, he, 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 he's hugely popular. The whole country roots for him, similar to what they're going to do for me. Hopefully, if we can play a game here, I can coach a game. Right now, they're rooting for me already – they give me all this praise and I'm like, I haven't even coached a practice yet. You know, like I really want to coach a practice here, but yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. I try to stay humble because there's some great coaches over there in the Philippines. I've been out there a couple of times when I was at Campbell coach McGee and let me go out there and see the landscape of Philippine mm-hmm. basketball. And there's some really good coaches out there that I've stayed in touch with. And Kai, they're all like hoping that he can, Kai Soto, they hope that he can make it to the NBA. And I think he's got a really good chance. <laughs> Absolute basketball.